Canto 1, Chapter 15, Chapter is entitled, The Pandavas Retired Timely, and this is verse 43. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Chiravasa Niraharo Bandavan Mukta Mordwajaha 
दर्शयात्मनो जादो माता विपा वि चारो मत पीसा चवात अनेक्सान मनो निरागात आरिबन बंदीरो यथावास निराहारो बंदव मुक मूर्ध्वजा दर्शयन मनो रूपम चंदुमात पीसा चवत अनेक्षान मनो निरागार अश्रिव बंदीरो यथा Chira vasa, accepted torn clothing. Nirahara, gave up all solid food stuff. Bandavak, stop talking. Mukta Murdva Jaha, untied his hair. Darshayan, began to show. Atmana, of himself, Rupam, bodily features, Jada, inert, Unmata, mad, Pisachavat, just like an urchin, Anavikshamana, without waiting for. Niragat was situated, Asravan, without hearing, Bandira, just like a deaf man, Yata, as if. So we're hearing towards the vinyl stages where Yudhisthira Maharaj is giving up all material attachments, now he's giving up all activities, not only attachments, but he's, he's giving up everything. And here the verse is, after that, Maharaj Yudhisthira dressed himself in torn clothing, gave up eating all solid foods, voluntarily became dumb, and let his hair hang loose. All this combined to make him look like an urchin or a madman with no occupation. Occupation. He did not depend on his brothers for anything, and just like a deaf man, 
he heard nothing. Hmm. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Purport. Thus being freed from all external affairs, he had nothing to do with imperial life or family prestige. And for all practical purposes, he posed himself exactly like an inert man, mad urchin, and did not speak of material affairs. He had no dependence on his brothers, who had all along been helping him. This stage of complete independence from everything is called, also called the purified stage of fearlessness. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Un Milita Mena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Nirvase Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adwaita Gadadara Sivasadi Gor Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Him. And so they wrote 30, 43 and 44 on the board. So they want me to read that verse too, so I will. Then it continues. He then started towards the north, treading the path accepted by his forefathers and great men, and devoted himself completely to the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he lived in that way wherever he went. Now this is a longer purport. It is understood from this verse that Maharaj Yudhisthira followed in the footsteps of his forefathers and the great devotees of the Lord. We have discussed many times before that the system of Anarsham Dharma, as was strictly followed by the inhabitants of the world, specifically by those who inhabited the Aravata province of the world, emphasizes the importance of leaving all household connections at a certain stage in life. The training and education was so delivered, and thus a respectable person like Maharaj Yudhisthira had to leave all family connection for self-realization and going back to Godhead. No king or respectable gentleman would continue family life till the end because that was considered suicidal and against the interests of the perfection of human life. In order to be free from all family encumbrances and, devoted, and devote oneself, sent per cent in a devotional service of the Lord, this system is recommended for everyone because it is the path of authority. The Lord instructs in the Bhagavad Gita that one must become a devotee of the Lord at least at the last stage of one's life. A sincere soul of the Lord, like Maharaj Yudhisthira, must abide by this instruction of the Lord for his own interest. The specific words Brahma Parma, Param indicate Lord Krishna. This is corroborated in the Bhagavad Gita by Arjuna with reference to great authorities like Asito, Devala, Narada, and Vyas. Thus, Maharaj Yudhisthira, while leaving home for the north, constantly remembered Lord Krishna within himself, following the footsteps of his forefathers as well as the great devotees of all times. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasma Shri Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swa Padanti Kam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So as there is a system for living in the world, there is a system for getting out of the world too. And this system for getting out of the world 
is very simple. One has to detach themselves from all worldly activities. And it says here, at least at the very end of one's life. This may not happen in the early part of his life, because usually it's very difficult for people to not want to go experience their materialistic ideas and adventures. When we come into this world, we are surrounded by so many arrangements made for our material activities, such as, such as family responsibilities, getting involved with education, completing education and getting a good position in society, establishing one's own family and then supporting that family through occupation and other activities, and dealing with all the responsibilities that come. This is material life and usually everyone goes through. So in order to make it what we say uh, natural, for the living entity, gradually one should move away from these activities and ultimately come to, in the later stage of one's life to complete surrender to the Supreme Lord in devotion. And that means one has to very carefully and systematically relieve oneself of all material responsibilities. Because as it's said in the scriptures, that is ultimately the goal of life, is to again awaken our loving relationship with Krishna and then reach, receive the reward of that love by it, returning to Krishna in the spiritual world and engaging in our real activities as a pure spirit soul, serving the Lord in loving devotion. So... Um, this process is there, and here it's mentioned there is a system by which one does that, and that is called the Van Ashram system. Normally, in the beginning of life, when one enters into spiritual life, they practice what is called brahmacharya. And in that stage of development, they learn how to serve the spiritual master, how to engage in various activities that please the Lord, how to understand and, un and to also speak Shastric knowledge, read, read, study, and speak Shastric knowledge, and gradually learn detachment from the material world. And then there is a choice after that matures to us so that one can move on or move to the Grihasta ashram, accept a wife, and develop what is called family life and practice Krishna consciousness in that atmosphere, along with uh, developing uh, children and teaching them the process of devotional service. Gradually, as, one, as the children grow up, and then they go on into their own life and take on their own responsibilities, and then the family activities reduce. And then as the man and women get older, the man starts to look towards renunciation of all material activities and he takes the vanaprastha. In that vanaprastha, he still he engages in devotional service along with the other devotees. And the woman goes to a holy place, she has no more responsibilities with family, and lives her life in a holy place serving the, the main deity in that holy place. And then she will return back to Godhead, dedicating her life to the Lord. And then the man, in his final stage of life, takes complete detachment from everything and takes the sannyas order. Now, it was very difficult for people to actually follow that process. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and Srila Prabhupada's... Um, spiritual master took the, the sannyas ashram and divided it into four categories, which was uh, kutichak, bahudak, pra pariva jakacharja, and paramahansa. Kutichak means that one still lives in the village where they were performing a living before, and uh, 
He detaches their activities in, in, in family life, doesn't perform any more activities, but they live in the village. Bahudak means that they move out of a particular domain, domain that they're living in and go around in the village area begging food and living simply on whatever they receive. That helps them to develop detachment and more dependence on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As that becomes developed and mature, the third stage is Parivakajarya, where they start to wander and travel all over the world and start to preach Krishna consciousness in different places around the world, in different villages, in different towns, uh, enlightening others. When that matures to the stage of perfection, in other words, when one has developed full realization of Krishna through that process, then one can retire to a holy place and simply finish their uh, spiritual life simply meditating on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the traditional system, but it's not the ISKCON system. <laughs> the ISKCON system is a little different, is that from the very beginning of life you detach from everything. <laughs> And then as you perform Krishna conscious, you become more attached. <laughs> Which is not supposed to happen. <laughs> but it does. We, we get attached to our uh, little cubicle where we keep all our stuff. <laughs> we get attached to the place where we sleep on the floor every day. <laughs> we get attached to the prashadam, making sure it's the, the kind I like. <laughs> so we develop some... I say, well, it shouldn't happen like that. But the idea is that devotional service is actually cannot wait to old age because especially in Kali Yuga, people don't live so long. Manda sumanda matayo manya bhagya padrita In this age, the duration of life is decreased simply by the atmosphere. And because the atmosphere is so permeated with sinful activities and also um, people are not accustomed to, to renunciation and at the same time practice devotional service, it is recommended that one take up the devotional service very quickly. Just like you see Srila Prabhupada, he came to the Western world and uh, you see, the people that came to him when he was preaching Krishna conscious, he was allowing anyone and everyone to come and hear his lectures and take part in the programs. But only the young people came. We found hardly anyone who was elderly coming because, as Prabhupada said, it's very hard to preach to the old fools <laughs> because they're so set in their own ways that they can't change. <laughs> And so he found that the hippie generation, those who were somewhat young and were adventurous and were looking for a way of life that, was, that they could find satisfaction in, he presented himself in the, by making prashadam and kirtan and a little bit of knowledge on the shastras, his main preaching, and people came. And they were young. I was quite older. I was 25 when I joined. But most of the devotees joined, they joined around the age of 20. Or even, even younger. Some devotees joined at 18, 19 years old. Left their families, left all of their material responsibilities, moved into the ashram and became fixed in Krishna consciousness. And they became so fixed in Krishna consciousness that Prabhupada actually gave them very important assignments to go in different places around the world and open up Krishna conscious temples and centers. And so Prabhupada sent devotees to Germany, to France, and to various other European countries. And after doing that for a while, Prabhupada thought, what about India? <laughs> I tried very hard to, pra to preach Krishna consciousness in India before I came to America. But nobody came forward. <laughs> he said the Indians were not interested in what I had to offer. And they were always thinking, well, you know, we, for so many years, we know all now about spiritual life. Now it's time for 
technology. <laughs> and so the technological revolution was starting to come and, you know, cars were getting better and people's phones were getting more advanced. <laughs> and people were more in, in, inclined to a more, what we say, materialistic way of life. But Prabhupada thought, I shouldn't give up on India because, you know, they, they have the Dharma, they have the Punya, they have the, the uh, Adhikari to become easy Krishna consciousness, but they're going in the wrong direction. So what should I do to preach to them? They don't want to hear me. Okay. So he took many of his young devotees who were, I mean, young, really young, most of them weren't married, some were, and brought them to India. And he brought them to Vrindavan, he brought them, he also brought them here to Bombay in the early 70s and many other places, just to show the population, the local population here, that this is what you're chasing after, but they gave it all up. <laughs> Now they're sitting on the floor eating kitchri, chanting and dancing and uh, finding life very, very happy. So he wanted to show by example how the Western mentality was now inclined to a renunciation because people had everything in the West. And some of the devotees that came to join Srila Prabhupada, their families were quite rich. I mean, not only rich, but very, very, very rich. And that's where most of the people came from Prabhupada after the initial persons, people who had good positions in society, their parents. We were all here hearing from just a few days ago from Giriraj Swami. His father was a millionaire. <laughs> His father was a millionaire. And when he started to become serious in Krishna consciousness, his father said, you come back home and I'll give you one million dollars. <laughs> one million dollars. Now that was 1970s. <laughs> How much was a million dollars worth then compared to now? The, the you know, the, the devaluation of currency has been very strong. So one million dollars then was about 30 million dollars today. So, but he, he refused. <laughs> he turned down this $1 million offer by his father. His father wanted to give him, in plus a nice position in, in an occupation at the same time. His father was a high court judge. <laughs> and then he practiced Krishna consciousness for many years. And then uh, after some time, he, as we all know, he joined Srila Prabhupada in helping open the Bombay Temple, which he, he wrote a beautiful book about. Mm -hmm. Maharaj was offering his books when he was here on Sunday. It's a ma magnificent story of the struggle that Srila Prabhupada went through in order to uh, secure that temple. Now, how the previous owners were doing everything to cheat the devotees, take the only devotees' money and not give him the land or the temple. But they didn't know who Prabhupada was. <laughs> Prabhupada was a fighter, and Prabhupada also knew how to deal in legal matters too. Although he was a great, you know, spiritualist, you know, a, a sadhu in all sense, he knew medicine and he knew legalities. <laughs> And so he knew how to use the legal, his legal intelligence, how to somehow or other fight against that. And Giri Raj Swami was his right-hand man in carrying out Srila Prabhupada's on the, on the ground work in order to develop that temple. And then his father and mother came to see their son when, they were, when he was with Srila Prabhupada. And uh, his mother was a little distraught. She wanted her son back. <laughs> when she saw her son, she said, oh my God, he's not eating. <laughs> he had been for performing some austerities. So his father was very, because he's an intelligent man, very respectable. So he very 
carefully again approached Srila Prabhupada and said, Srila Prabhupada, I'll give you one million dollars if you send him back. <laughs> again, the offer of one million dollars. And uh, Prabhupada said, you have to ask him. <laughs> In other words, Prabhupada deferred to Giri Radhaswami. And the answer was the same. <laughs> Krishna is more valuable than any of that paper money you're trying to offer me. <laughs> so, yeah. So you see how devotees who had opportunities, and this he was just one of many devotees like that in America and also in Europe, who were quite materially well situated. But when they tasted the happiness of Krishna consciousness and the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, they were ready to give everything up and live very simply and chant Hare Krishna and uh, you know, simply uh, engage in very you know, nice activities into the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Lord Chaitanya, who is Krishna himself, has made this process of Krishna consciousness really, really simple. When you read the Shastras, it's very difficult to understand how to apply the Shastras. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is very, very merciful. He's Krishna himself. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nohiyonya. He is, he is Krishna in the mood of Radharani, his own pure devotee, in order to teach how to serve the Supreme Lord from the position of a devotee. He is the, he is a, the Lord, but he takes the position of his own devotee, teaching from the position of a, of a devotee how to serve himself. And so he is very merciful. He makes the process easy. But when he was here in his in his form as Krishna Vrindavan, he spoke very carefully in the science of Bhagavad Gita to Arjun, and that is the basis of all the philosophical knowledge that we practice in Krishna consciousness. And at the end, after summing up all of the different aspects of the knowledge, Krishna said. Uh, uh, you know, sarva dharma pariksa cham mame kam saranam vajam aham tvam sarva pape vyo moksa yishyami. Just surrender to me, that's all. Forget about everything else. You have so many ideas on how you're going to be happy in this world, and you may also have any ideas how you can practice spiritual life, but forget all of these things. Just surrender to me. Uh, ma sucha, I'll take care of you. Do not fear, do not worry. And do not uh, hesitate. Here we're hearing from this particular previous verse at the end of the purport that one who, who has faith in Krishna develops fearlessness. In the material world, fear is a very strong element. Where people are motivated to do things by fear, people are, are uh, motivated to, do to not do things by fear. Fear is an element that somehow or other pervades people's life in such a way that they think how to do things based on how, they, uh, how fearful they are or not are. You know, we just went through this epidemic of this uh, coronavirus and fear was a very strong element for people in order to um, live in such a way as to... Uh, or downsize all of their activities. But fear is very debilitating. Recently I heard a story about fear and how fear works. Fear is so bad that it actually can, it causes actually death. So here it says one who's free from fear, can, one can only be free from fear if they take full shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, who is fear feared by fear personified in the very beginning of the this first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in one verse in the first chapter it's mentioned that I think it's verse number uh, 14 yeah it says um, yeah living beings who are entangled in the complicated meshes of birth and death 
can be freed immediately, even unconsciously, by chanting the holy name of Krishna, which is fear by fear personified. So Krishna says, the wind blows out of fear of me. Um, death takes its toll out of fear of me. So Krishna is the supreme principle of all shelter, and therefore even fear itself has no entrance to one who takes shelter of Krishna. But I'll explain to you in one little story, and I think that's a little interesting, one story how fear works. This is an antidote, it's a little story, where one man, he's living in a, a small town, and he's walking around, and he's coming to the outskirts of the town, and he sees this very tall man standing there dressed all in black. He's never seen anything like that before, so he gets curious. So he walks up to the man and asks him, who you are, who are you, what are you doing? The man pulls, he has a mask on, he pulls his mask off, he says, I am death. I've come to take 500 people from this town in the next one month. <laughs> right to the point. So the man gets a little concerned. He's hearing that 500 of us will no longer be living after one month. So he goes all around the town and tells everyone, death is, has come and 500 of us are going to die in the next, you know, next uh, month, so take precaution. And so he spreads this statement around. So after one month, uh, 5,000 people died, not 500, 5,000. So now he's still there. He goes to the outskirts of the town and sees that same man standing there. And he comes up to him, he said, you know, death, you said you were going to take 500, but you took 5,000. He said, no, I took 500, 4,500 died out of fear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how debilitating fear can be, where people become so paralyzed simply by this, this mindset that they actually, everything goes wrong. So one, one can be fearless when they take shelter of Krishna because Krishna, that's why Krishna says, just simply surrender to me and I'll, take, I'll, I'll free you from all anxiety, all fearfulness, everything. If you take shelter of me, you're fully protected. Krishna guarantees that. One who, who surrenders to me, I give them full protection in all aspects of life. So when Krishna said that, not too many people believed him. <laughs> Although they read Bhagavad Gita and they found Bhagavad Gita very uh, attractive and interesting, when they came to surrender, it wasn't like that. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he came after and he said, don't worry about surrender. Just chant, dance and take prasad, that's all. <laughs> He said, just chant the holy names of the Lord. Develop your, your Krishna consciousness by serving and associating with Vaishnavas and take nice Krishna prasadam. That is the process. Haribo. So he made it easy. And Prabhupada said, even though Mahaprabhu made it so easy, still people are not coming. <laughs> so then Mahaprabhu would would send his devotees to different places to try to really beg them to come. So he would send Nityananda and Srila Haridas Thakur. They would travel together. They would knock on people's door in the different villages under the order of Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya said, make everyone Krishna conscious. Teach them how to chant this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So they would go and knock on the doors and say, oh, Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Lord, he's here. And he's come with the mercy of the holy name. And if you chant the holy names of God, you will be happy and all of your problems will be solved. And they would say, oh, Nityananda, what you're saying is very nice, but we have so many things to do. We have no time. 
We have our families, we have our occupations, we have our animals to take care of, we have so many things to do. We'll never be able to find time. And Lord Nityananda, he would not accept their refusals. So he would grab a straw or a stick and he put it in his mouth and then he would roll on the ground and beg them. This is the Supreme Lord, Lord Sri Nityananda himself. He would beg the people to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamad. And they would say, oh, Nitai, 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 get up, get up, get up. Okay, we'll chant, we'll chant, we'll chant. <laughs> so he would go to that extreme just to, just to give the mercy. So, Therefore, the mercy of Gaur Nittai is the highest form of all mercy. Prabhupada said, even if you don't want it, you get it. <laughs> and he used the example, a, man, a rich man, you'll be, you'll be with a, in the presence of a rich man. And he likes you, and he wants to give you something. So he takes some money out of his pocket and says, here, this is for you. And you say, well, you're very nice, you're very kind, but thank you very much. That's okay, you keep it. He says, no, no, I want to give it to you. No, 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 that's okay, okay. But then he sees you're not going to take it, so he pushes it in your pocket, closes your pocket, says it's yours. <laughs> Another way, he forces you to take it. That's Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> Just like I remember when we were here many years ago, there was a Sankirtan story that the devotees told during the Christmas marathon, which we just were involved in where the devotees were in, uh, what is there, Shivaji Chatur, what is the train, the train station, what is it called? Chaturpati Shivaji train station. So the devotees had book tables there and they were, they were distributing books there. So one man, there was a few of the book distributors in that area, so one man, he was walking along, so one of our devotees came up to him and offered to sell him a book. He said, no, no, I'm not interested. Thank you very much. And he walked on. So he's walking a little farther in the train area, and another devotee comes up to him, same person, <laughs> and it tries to sell him a book. First devotee, the second devotee didn't know he was already approached. So he just happened to pick the same man. <laughs> Again, the man said, I'm sorry, thank you very much. I, I, I'm not interested. I'm going on. So he went on, and then after walking for some time, a third book distributor came to the same man. <laughs> and then he said, all right, it must be, must be God's arrangement. <laughs> so devotees don't give up <laughs> so easy. <laughs> so after being approached three times, he eventually uh, bought the book. So that is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. He makes sure you can't go away. <laughs> Just like it says that people in India come to the West for two reasons. <laughs> they go to the Western countries for two reasons. One, for sense gratification. And two, to preach. One or the two. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati makes this. So we meet people from India coming to the West for sense gratification all the time. And then we invite them into our temples and then they become devotees. <laughs> so they leave India, so they want to make more money. They hear the West is just, you know, it's a land of milk and honey and money just falls off the trees and you can pick it up off the ground. There's so much there. Even people walk past it, there's, 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 there's more for every, it's not like that. <laughs> But this is this idea that the West has everything. So people come to the Western countries in order to further their economic growth and to live very nicely. But a lot of times they meet the devotees and then their life changes. And so, um, so that, that, that's why it says that if you try to run away from India to, to get to escape to the Western countries, Lord Chaitanya will chase you down. So, <laughs> better to surrender where you are now <laughs> instead of getting chased by Lord Chaitanya later on. <laughs> so that's his mercy. He's so kind and so merciful that he he, he has this strong desire to give uh, everyone this great treasure of love of God which is the, uh, 
It's the greatest of all treasures because when you have Krishna, you have everything. And when you don't have Krishna, you have nothing. <laughs> Even though you may have everything because Krishna, well, Krishna is the foundation by which everything exists. And happiness centers around devotional service to Krishna. So Maharaj Yudas there, he had a kingdom. I mean, he was not only a kingdom, he was the emperor of the world. They had fought a huge battle where 640 million soldiers were killed in order to establish Yudhisthira on the throne and the Pandavas as the rightful rulers of the world. And Yudhisthira, he ruled for, for a long time, but after some time, he understood that the goal of life is not simply to maintain one's material occupation to the end of life. As it says here, that the later part of life, for those who haven't actually made that step before, means that, you know, the body's breaking down, time is getting short, and therefore the goal of life should be the only focus at that time, because what can you do at that point in life? But you see, many people, Prabhupada talks about that, in Western countries specifically, people when they get old, they just go on vacation, they use whatever money they save, and they sit around uh, playing ping pong and checkers and, and, uh, and play golf, and they just talk about how nice it was when they were young. <laughs> you know, take out the old books with the pictures of the family 50 years ago, and just reminisce how wonderful it was. <laughs> but So this is it's just like this sad nostalgia that uh, people in, in Western countries, when they get old, rather than taking up spiritual life, they just leave their body in a very un, un, unhappy situation, just finishing their life up, more like a vegetable who can't do anything. So hey, they in America, it's very big. They have these old age homes where your parent, your children don't want you anymore because they're grown up and they consider the parents a burden to take care of. They want to live their life. So they, they put the, ch the parents in these homes. They pay money for these caretakers to take care of the old people. And then they just sit around doing nothing. They've been talking about nonsense and just eating some food a couple times a day and just watching television. <laughs> and it's a very sad situation because, um, as it's explained here, the Van Ashram system teaches one that life has different stages. And at least in the last stage of life, one should do dedicate themselves fully in pure devotional service to the Lord. So we have the example uh, of Maharaj Yudhisthira who showed that renunciation is the process, but what was he renouncing? He wasn't renouncing a nice house and some family members. He was renouncing a kingdom with so many, you know, arrangements for his glorification. He had everything, unrivaled kingdom, but gave it all up because he understood that uh, this material world is simply a, a stepping stone to go back to the spiritual world. It's not a place where you hang out. <laughs> it's a place where you go. Lord Jesus Christ said, this world is like a bridge. Walk across it, but do not establish any permanent resident uh, upon it. So it's a place where we move forward towards our real home, which is the spiritual world. And here we get so many examples throughout the scriptures of great souls, Maharaj Parikshit also, Maharaj Yudhisthira, Prithu Maharaj, <clears throat> and many, many other great personalities have left everything and simply uh, uh, are teaching us by their own example that the goal of life is to dedicate one's life to the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, so we'll stop here. See if there's any comments or questions. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, at Vishwambar?
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Vishwam Bhar. Yes, yes, Maharaj. With a name like that, wow. That's the name for Lord Chaitanya. He's big, like Lord Chaitanya. He's very tall. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, we are blessed by your association for so many days here. So, uh, I'm thinking of uh, like this theme is of a renunciation of Yudhishthir Maharaj, he renounced a kingdom. And uh, similarly, all the devotees in the Hare Krishna movement, uh, they, are, they are invariably supposed to uh, raise their internal level of re renunciation, like it's about renunciation of the heart. Mm. So just like Kutichak, Bahudak, that way, gradually. Uh, so, how uh, can a devotee actually uh, have this quality of renunciation in his heart? In the sense, how can be happy? He stay happy performing devotional service in spite of uh, going through several reversals in his life, which is going to be a natural thing in this world, like reversals are natural thing in his life and so everyone will go through many, th uh, many things that he doesn't expect to happen. So how can a devotee stay happy and detached and be satisfied doing well, devotional service? That's easy. Mm -hmm. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Visayam dini vartante niharasya dehinam raso varjam raso pyasya Param Drisva Nivartante. He said, you can't give up the lower taste unless you get the higher taste. If you're hungry and you haven't eaten for a long time and someone comes along with a, you know, like a three-day-old chapati and says, here, well, here's something to eat. Well, you think, oh, well, I'm so hungry, I'll, I'll take it. But then after you, he hands you to the chapati, and then Vishwambar comes over with a big feast and says, here, here's a nice feast of kachoris, poris, ladus, samosas, and, you know, uh, pao bhaji, so many nice things. <laughs> and, sorry, Krishna, <laughs> we haven't given that one up yet. <laughs> So then you think, well, what is this, this old chapati? You know, I'll take the feast. So it's like that. So when you get the higher taste, which is Krishna consciousness, then it's easy and natural to give up these, um, this uh, lower taste, which comes by, you know, just trying to satisfy your senses in this material world. So there is, Krishna consciousness is the higher taste. <laughs> It's sweet. <laughs> it's not only sweet, it's actually the pl platform of freedom. Nobody likes to be controlled. Therefore, if you want to be free from all control, you could be a devotee, and you're free. And then you're free in the sense that you're only controlled by one person, that's Krishna. <laughs> His representatives are also are in that position. But Krishna controls his devotee in such a way as that he makes his devotee happy. He sees his devotee engaged in devotional service, the Lord becomes pleased, he gives the devotee happiness. So the devotee is free to serve the Lord and actually becomes happy at the same time. Really happy. Not just artificially happy. Artificially happy means that you have to believe you're happy in order to live life, because if you don't believe you're happy, you can't go on. <laughs> That's artificial, but a devotee experiences that happiness. Mm -hmm. What is that? Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Nasoshati Nakangshati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhakti Lavate Param yeah. So, prasanatma means not only happy, but joyful, real happiness. That's Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, go for the happiness. 
And then it becomes easy to give up all these other things. Natural. But if you give them up ahead of time without being happy and you engage in devotional service, you'll still become happy. <laughs> it's a little harder that way. That's why we invite people, just come, chat with us, dance, take some prasadam, read some nice books. You get a taste for Krishna consciousness. As that taste develops, then it becomes easy to leave behind all of the material things that are just keeping us struggling in this world. Yeah. Even if you don't believe in Krishna, at least devotional service is happy. <laughs> it's even, we, we, we would some, sometimes say, people would say, they would say to us, well, what happens if everything you, you're doing is not true? In other words, if there was no Krishna there, you're wasting your whole life. No, we would say, no, it's actually, even if Krishna is not there, the process of devotional service is so nice that we're happy anyway. <laughs> And you, you have to make believe you're happy. <laughs> and there's nothing there. At the end of life, you lose everything. <laughs> so, yeah. So, from all angles of vision, you can't lose. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you take up Krishna consciousness, at every stage, it becomes a feature of freeing ourselves from suffering and Awakening our, uh, uh, what is it called, anandam buddhi vardhanam, that, that happiness that is unlimited. <laughs> Chant, dance, take prasad, read books, and if you feel really inclined, come and do some service. <laughs> Is that all right? Your life is a testimony for us. You, uh, when you sing Guru Puja, you just sing for Prabhupada for the pleasure of uh, Prabhupada and uh, Krishna, and that's why you are happy. So uh, we can learn from your example to be focused on Guru and Krishna. Mm, Prabhupada made hippies into happies. <laughs> so Prabhupada is magical. So you come in contact with Prabhupada and your life changes automatically. <laughs> Prabhupada's mercy. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions? <laughs> Thank you. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.